Lord my God, when I am in a worsome wonder, consider all thy words thy hand has made, thy power throughout the universe displayed. My name is Henry Kilonzi Wambua. I'm a licensed land surveyor. I was then taken to the world, the, to, the, to, to the checking, and they found, yes, this guy has a problem. He has meningitis. <clears throat> so within time, I realized uh, I could not hear anything. When I was leaving the, to the, the hospital, I was already not getting communication. Something was happening. I wasn't quite sure. It was a shock. <clears throat> it was a real shock. And because, you know, for me, having been an active man, being involved in this, and then you can't hear it all. I'm a musician. I cannot be able to sing. And I was looking forward to getting healed and getting better, but it never improved. <clears throat> so now, the thing was, how do you communicate? <clears throat> the man cannot hear. And uh, there is no way of communication. I'm a surveyor. I can't move. I can't do much. Now you can imagine from 1999 up to, up to 2012. Those are 13 years. And with 13 years, I had to work, I had to find ways of how to communicate, I had to find ways of how to live and how to survive. So they have to write for me, for me to hear what they're saying and be able to, sorry, to get what they're saying so that I can communicate. It was devastating for them, but I thank them. They really have helped. But we actually to travel, but you know, traveling there is expensive. And so what happened is uh, they decided that we are going to have a it in Kenya and will be the first lot to do it in Nairobi. And that was again good news, good news, waiting for this to come and be done. Then I heard somebody saying, Wambua, Wambua. Then I said, Wambua, who is calling? And then I asked them, who is calling Wambua? He said, ah, he can hear, he can hear, he can hear. No, I was even hearing that uh, somebody is calling my name. Oh, it is done, it is done. And for sure now, it was done. Oh, great, <laughs> great. It's like God has come down. <laughs> you know, the fact that you have not been hearing and you are deaf, you can't hear a thing. It is so, everything is quiet on you and all of a sudden, Wambua, Wambua, and you're wondering, oh, that was exciting. I started with a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to take me from point A to point B. Then after that, now, then I started after that, I started using two, which were supporting me. What do you call them? Crutches. Crutches. I was using two crutches, one on one, one side. And I walked with that for quite some time. Then slowly by slowly, I moved up from crutches to one crutch. And uh, then went on with that. Now I can walk without but I cannot do much. Outside there, it was more than that. It could be maybe double that. But here, it was, uh, it has, it has, it was quite reasonable, at least three million. But that time, it was more. Hello. Yes. Fine. Yeah. You are what? Yes. Then sings my soul, my Savior, go to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, go to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. The day all of us were looking forward to after surgery, what I'm going to do today is to switch on the device. And I will try to make sounds, environmental sounds, just audible. 
today is not the day he can uh, express uh, or, or rather talk on phone. Once he tells me today I'm going home, I can talk to somebody in the States, then I have to work on the expectations. I'm going to uh, test the device and then I will measure the impedances and then from there we will, I'll carry you through step by step. The implant is already inserted. Now this is the speech or audio processor. So we are going, or I am going to program it for him and then we will be having subsequent visits to review the progress. There may be complaints in low sounds, uh, medium sounds, or high-pitched sounds. Now that is the work of mapping. So uh, our target is to get a stable program or a stable map where he will minimize the visits to my clinic and the speech therapist's clinic, but he will be comfortable. Uh, remember at the counseling sessions we said the journey begins after surgery and when we switch on now we should be ready to run the whole hog. Here we have a magnet which links the external part to the internal part. So I will try. He is not going to be hearing. Of course you may hear some beeps but uh, he is not here. We are now stimulating the nerve. He may just feel sensation, but it's not actual hearing. For us, we, are, we can hear this because we have good hearing, but for him, we are working on the auditory nerve. Now he starts to hear, and he will have to tell me, when I present the tone, does he hear it? Too soft, he will just point to the small dots. If he hears it, it's comfortable, but it is still soft. He will just point at the, the corresponding uh, dot. We are looking for a sound stimulation level where he's comfortable. He says, it is not too loud, it is not too soft. total of six patients that were implanted uh, uh, at the same time as Louis and all the six of them now have been switched on. Louis has been the last one to be switched on and all of them did a uh, passive sound and they have all started their rehabilitation. Yes. We would like those people who have problem of uh, hearing and potentially maybe they can benefit from cochlear implantation is to register so that they get the disability benefit. And the disability benefit means that they can get their cochlear implant without taxation, tax-free. If you have a problem of hearing, go to a professional who is able to assess you and advise you accordingly. You never really know how to react because it's one of those things that happens to other people not you you know so and so in my family lost this lost that it happens to other people and never happens to you so when it comes home 
you you don't know how to react you don't know what to say what to do it was just shock and like okay clearly this is what this is the hand we were dealt we just need to learn how to adapt Now we are going live. Hello. It's too bad. The medley of sounds. Can you hear me, Louis? Yeah, that's not Joseph, it's Dr. Dean. Yeah, look at me, please. Hey, this side, Louis. The directionalization is affecting the stock. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but did you hear your name? Did you hear your name? Yeah. Our expectation was that he would be able to hear and uh, uh, speak. He, he had the background noises, he had the speech, he even said he's able to hear himself, in which case he's able to moderate his own, uh, his uh, volume. <laughs> yes. For children, they will hear the sound, but it takes them much longer to identify those sounds, for those sounds to be meaningful, because they have never heard. But for Rui now, he is reconnecting, he is re relearning what he knew. So it's much easier for him, but even for him, he will take time uh, through rehabilitation, he will take a few months, before he starts becoming comfortable. <laughs> so, ah, uh, you're sounding funny. But yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, how do I sound? Okay, you need to stop speaking. Okay, okay. <laughs> that that is good. What is your name? You ask me what is my name. If anybody implanted outside, we have no discrimination. The speech therapist and audiologist take them on and they go on with the rehabilitation process. The major problem is if they were not well counseled, because the, 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 the pre-operative counseling is to get the patient to know that they will have to dedicate a substantial amount of time and resources to rehabilitation. What are your expectations today? Because you can hear. Because you can hear. Uh, the team feels great, and especially because we are getting more and more people to appreciate that cochlear implantation can be done in Kenya, rehabilitation can be done in Kenya. With time, these sounds will be put into perspective. I'm very optimistic now. It's hard to maintain optimism over such a long time, but I'm very optimistic. The brain, your brain, will start learning to understand what these sounds are. After two and a half years of no sound, expectations were he'd hear something but it'd be very low. Today is your new birthday in terms of hearing. After several visits, after several rehabilitation visits, stop speaking. Yes. I think the hardest part was watching other people try and communicate with them. Because over the time, over the period, we learned, we developed kind of like a sign language. But other people trying would, would say, oh, he can hear, it's just, you know, psychological. Oh, he can hear, it's just, you know, shout loud enough. You are a baby as far as speech is concerned today. Did you just call me a baby? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's interacted with us, I mean, as any father would in every aspect of our lives. School, uh, relationships, um, watching TV together. So everything we go through, he's there with us. So for him to miss out on the part where uh, my sister would come on and speak with him about how her day was, what she liked, what she didn't like, I felt for him. And you know, as even though we were developing our own little communication patterns, you could still tell he was missing the, the, a really big chunk. Whatever little hope we had, we hung on to it, and now it's flowering. <laughs> I'm happy, yeah. What are you looking forward to now that 
he is he's getting somewhere. Football. Definitely. That's the one thing we bonded over over everything else. We don't take any of this for granted at all. Whether it's family, friends, and even when we appeal to the entire country and they came through, we don't take any of it for granted. You face them and then you can hear. But yours is because uh, your voice has changed. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take time. It is a huge transformation. You go from sitting in a vacuum, literally, to hear it. It is a very huge frustration when you're sitting and you're looking at somebody and the only thing you're saying is, why can't I hear you? I've toned down some things, especially the high frequency map, I tried to tone it down and still we can communicate. Not having to share paper between us, I measure that as progress. That's a indicator, a huge indicator for me, because you remember, we would not have this conversation without paper between us. So for me, that's the first marker, that you can ask me your question, and I don't have to look down on paper to answer you. He is one of our staff patients. Three months down the line, uh, he should be able to communicate 100% orally. For now, you are talking at our room projection level. I can actually be a part of the conversation. You realize for over two and a half years I've been left out of the conversation, not because they want to leave me out, but because it's difficult to have a conversation when every other line has to be put down on paper. So now I'm at a stage where my daughter can come up to me, my son can come up to me, my wife can come up to me, and they can say things to me, and I can respond. And it's just amazing to hear them. When I start speaking, this is not the first thing they do, because initially when I would try and respond, the first thing they would do is lower your voice, because I was shouting. There's so many basic things that I had completely shut down on. And the exercises that I'm going through now, they're basic, but they're essential because then I can listen to you properly. And these are things which we don't worry about. We take them for granted because we speak and we hear. But going back to the basic level, and it's sometimes it feels bad when they're very basic sounds and I can't make them out. Like right now, I can't catch the M sound and we've tried it the whole week. And that's the first thing I told Joseph when I came and he said, hey, I can't hear this. So he told me, no, that's part of the process. You scored not so well when it came to this link sound. Mm. The link sound. Mm. It will not come back in a blast. And I think it's important that this is shared because the expectation is sometimes too high. And I don't blame the expectation because this knowledge is not widely shared. A lot of people would ask me immediately after surgery, are you okay now? Can you hear? And then you have to explain this kind of surgery is in steps. The learning process doesn't end. It's a lot. And this has been an effort that went out from my family to the public. And the only thing that gave me the courage to go out there is because I did my work as a national duty. I said, if my work had any value, then help me. And the help came. You sent me a text just the night before we did the interview. And uh, you'd said that, one, you don't like doctors. Two, you don't like journalists. And here I was thinking, well, I'm a doctor. I'm a journalist, I'm double in the crossfire. You had everything wrong. I had everything wrong. So, but, so when, when, when I actually agreed to do this story and after reading that, I was thinking, okay, this is like any other story. Until now when I met you and I realized, I think that's when the doctor heart came in, that Louis cannot hear. He actually cannot hear. During the interview when you broke down that you can't hear your daughter when she comes 
when she comes back home from school. And there I was sitting and literally I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me because I, I didn't know what to do or what to react because this is now, this is real. It got more real at that point. There are doctors that can assist. We have the specialist, we have the technologists, we have everything. And so for me it was, we have to see this through through any way possible. And I'm really grateful that Kenyans heed the call and they came to assist. And now we are telling a story with a happy ending. My heart goes out to those who may not be able to access this. Because now I know what it is. And I know the transformation. Even though I'm still at a very elementary stage in achieving the desired target, I'm grateful. I'm happy. So when was the last time you were in a studio setting like this one? I was actually right here in the studio, and that was the lead up to the 2012 elections. And I was doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with presidential candidates. That was the last time I sat in the studio. I could see the system was going too fast. Uh. I could see. And I wrote because this afternoon thrown out the end. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. So do you miss this work? Do you miss being in studio, hosting, talking to people? Do you miss this work? I miss this work. It's the only work I know to do. <laughs> this is the thing that I've been good at. I talk. I'm a, I'm a show host. <laughs> I talk to people. Another day, another time, you would be my guest. It would be the other way around, and I'll be talking to you. So this is a very new position for me to be in. But yes, to answer you directly, I would love to be able to do this again. What would you focus on? Is, has, has it changed your way of looking at things or handling things such that if you come back to the newsroom, if you come back to hosting a show and talking to Kenyans, will it change your kind of discussions and even how you frame and package your discussions? It wouldn't change in the essence that there was a reason for me doing this kind of work in the first place. What would increase is the intensity of the conversation. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of positions, there's a lot of people I want to challenge. I'm not in the loop right now, of course, being in the situation I've been in, pretty much living in a cave, I've missed out on the everyday events, but Still, I pick it up. I'd want to get people to be accountable for these positions they got out of the vote, because that's what we are. We're a democratic country. So we educate on why you need to vote, and then we educate on the challenge you need to give those who have those positions. So I guess I would have a lot to engage in. Now you're getting me all geared up. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a very endearing journey. This has been a very deep journey for me. I thank God, first of all, I'm here by His grace. I thank my family that remained supportive. I've had very special friends. I've had very special doctors. The team led by Professor Masharia, there's my physicians, there's Dr. Dean, there's Professor Chunge. They've all pulled in. More importantly, I want to thank Kenyans because I considered my job a national duty. And I came back to Kenyans and said, please help me because I need to get back to this position. And they came up and people have prayed for me all over the country. They've gone together in groups and they've sent their support and their encouragement and their prayers. And I'm very grateful for this. Wherever you may be hearing me now, thank you for putting me back where I am. Of course, we have the institutions that have worked with us. We have here, <laughs> we, have, we have Dr. Julius Kipnitich, we have the Standard Group who worked very hard at this, and we're back at here. I'm grateful for that opportunity. And the hospitals have been there to help. The NHIF has been there to help. These are systems that you will interrogate and see that they're working. But in the end, this has been a combined effort that has enabled me to come back and sit here like this and have this conversation with you. This is one of Louis Otieno's story, 
a silent and quiet one that he closes that chapter and hopefully opens another one that gives hope not only to him but for the many Kenyans out there with hearing impairment. For Health Digest, I'm Dr. Masi Korir.